Thank you, Laurie. Um, so I, I see a number of uh, familiar faces in the audience. Uh, and uh, I think for, the, for those of you who know me, have taken my classes, uh, this will be a bit of a, come a, as a little bit of a surprise. The topic today will come as a little bit of a surprise. It's, a, it's, it's a unusually applied for what I typically do. Uh, and this is a, uh, a joint paper. My co-author is an executive at Amundi Asset Management. Uh, and it's very much in the spirit of taking academic research, the implications of academic research, and then uh, uh, offering uh, a concrete solution uh, that uh, might mitigate a, a big problem that uh, 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 exists with uh, financial markets. Of course, there's always a bit of disagreement on whether there is a problem, but let me, let me uh, jump right in and, and tell you where I stand. Uh, so in case you had any doubt, uh, I, I, I like this cartoon a lot. Let me just read it for you. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. Um, so, you know, uh, one, one, one important problem with uh, short-termism is, of course, uh, the lack of uh, um, um, awareness in financial markets of the, the risks that, that uh, exist with, uh, with climate change and climate change mitigation policies. That's not going to be my topic today. Um, what I want to uh, do today is first give you a very broad um, a background on um, uh, what the state of the art of what's known about short-term oriented capital markets, uh, the, the pressures uh, that capital markets uh, uh, exert on innovators, and then I will move on, uh, move on to what, the, what is the core of our paper, which is a, a very, you know, uh, a, step, a small step in the right direction, a solution that we are proposing, which is uh, uh, to have issuers issue loyalty shares. And, uh, and then I will, uh, show, uh, I will discuss briefly how loyalty shares can be a good solution for startups uh, looking to do an IPO. So in a nutshell, you know, uh, uh, this year, um, well, la the last Nobel Prize was awarded. One of the uh, uh, people who got the prize uh, was uh, Bob Schiller. And Bob Schiller's work can be summarized. You know, uh, the one reason why he got the prize, one, one main reason why he got the prize is he was the first to really emphasize this idea that there's excess volatility in uh, capital markets. And uh, this, this uh, plot here summarizes well uh, what, what is meant by that. And, uh, and what is meant by that is if you look at the volatility in GDP growth or the volatility in uh, what he refers to as uh, a fair value, uh, um, uh, fair present discounted value of stocks in the S&P 500, uh, uh, and then you look at the volatility of the actual S&P, you see that the S&P is very volatile relative to volatile, uh, volatility of GDP growth, meaning uh, a volatility of, GD of uh, earnings growth, etc. Now, there's a lot of controversy, of course, in how you calculate fair value. There's a huge uh, uh, research agenda that developed out of that. I'm not going to go into this, but the point is this plot really highlights uh, the extent to which uh, as uh, asset markets can be volatile. Another important uh, uh, stylized fact is uh, that uh, over time we've seen a lot more turnover in financial markets and uh, we've seen a lot less buy and hold. And here you have just, this is just for the NYSE, but you can uh, find that for pretty much all uh, stock markets. You, uh, the average holding period uh, for stocks has basically gone from over eight years uh, in the 1950s uh, down to a few months uh, today, okay? And, uh, and uh, if you look at um, uh, um, institutional investors, pension funds and so on, um, well, it's less problematic. Uh, there's been less of a erosion in, in uh, holding, average holding periods. Uh, this is uh, interesting work by uh, 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 the authors here, Kramers, Perik, and Soutner. But still, Notice, you know, fidelity, right, uh, uh, has, uh, you know, at its peak has an average holding period of about two years. Uh, and uh, you see uh, 
the Chicago endowment uh, is all below two years, uh, and uh, the Ohio pension fund uh, below two years. The only one that really stands out is uh, is uh, you know our uh, our favorite example of a long-term investor, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, and they have a they have a uh, you know uh, something that hovers between three years and four or four and a half years average holding period of stocks. Um, what else do we know about uh, short-term pressures? Uh, this is an influential study by Graham Harvey and uh, Raj Gopal, uh, and they surveyed uh, CFOs, and they all, you know, a very large uh, fraction of CFOs said, so here, let me quote from their study, more than three-fourths of the surveyed executives would give up economic value in exchange for smooth earnings. In other words, they would not invest, even though they are sitting on, on positive NPV uh, investment opportunities. Um, this is a quote from uh, Dominic Barton, the CEO of uh, McKinsey. Uh, and uh, let, let me just read it to you. This will, this will uh, uh, um, um, you know, the significance of what, uh, what this uh, slide says will become, will be truly revealed in a couple of slides. So for now, you may be somewhat puzzled by, by why I'm emphasizing this but it will become clear later why this is important. Okay, so let me just read that quote. When McKinsey's finance experts deconstruct the value expectations embedded in share prices, we typically find that 70% to 90% of a company's value is related to cash flows expected three or more years out. Okay? Um, Another important finding in, uh, that McKinsey emphasizes, uh, this is really uh, super interesting, this is a, a massively under-researched uh, topic, and that is just the amount of time that uh, directors uh, spend uh, engaging with the, with the companies, uh, on the boards on which uh, uh, they sit. And uh, so, you know, one, one uh, 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 difference that uh, uh, McKinsey likes to emphasize is that for private equity firms, your, your typical director will spend about 54 days a year uh, engaging with the business, whereas for publicly traded uh, firms, it's between 12 and 32 days. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, this actually underestimates even the important difference. Uh, you, you, you hear of a lot of uh, uh, privately held firms, family-owned firms, where you have uh, uh, non-executive directors spending several months uh, a year, uh, up to six months, engaging with the company. And that's you know, extremely rare for uh, uh, publicly traded uh, uh, companies. OK, um, one other, one other uh, uh, important slide I want to uh, 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 highlight before I come back to the McKinsey study. OK, so this is from Google's uh, uh, S1 uh, registration statement. And don't read everything. I've highlighted what I want you to pay attention to. So it's all about, you know, uh, Google is about the long, uh, uh, the long run, try creating value in the long run and so on. But notice what the uh, statement says. We would request that our shareholders take the long-term view. Okay? This is as far as it goes to try and engage with uh, shareholders, getting them to invest in the long, uh, to think in, in, uh, in the long term. It's a request. And what I will mention later is that a request is not enough. You know, here, uh, uh, Laurie mentioned there's no such thing as a free lunch. Well, for, finan uh, for finan uh, financial investors, same thing. You can't just request them to, to take some actions. You have to reward, uh, you have to reward uh, those actions. Um, okay, so here's the point about, uh, put the two things together, the earlier slide uh, from McKinsey and this one, and, and then really it's, uh, it's quite striking. Uh, so this is a... Uh, 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 McKinsey and the, and, the, and the Canadian Pension Fund uh, did a survey of board members, and here's what they find. They find that 79% of respondents felt pressures to demonstrate uh, financial performance over a period of just two years or less. And 44% said they used a time horizon of less than three years in setting strategy. And 46% of respondents said that the pressure to deliver short-term financial performance stemmed from their boards. And board members made it clear they were channeling short-term pressures from investors. Okay, So you can see the chain and you can see the potential damage 
Uh, and uh, and I, I would argue that among investors, um, unfortunately, what I've shown you earlier, you know, a big constituency out there among investors that exert short-term pressures are institutional investors, pension fund managers, who should have a long-term view and not uh, and, and not, uh, themselves not be so concerned about short-term uh, uh, price uh, uh, valuations. Okay, now um, this will become relevant later when I talk about IPOs. Uh, so Elon Musk, uh, SpaceX, right? So he has some beautiful statements about uh, why he doesn't want to go public with SpaceX. Uh, and Elon, uh, and by the way, if you haven't followed, SpaceX together with um, uh, Boeing um, are going to be the two main companies that are going to uh, uh, be uh, uh, that NASA is going to use to send uh, to send uh, you know um, rockets into into uh, outer space, uh, etc. So you know this is a pretty amazing amazing achievement uh, for a, for a startup, and and Elon Musk of course is the is the founder of uh, of uh, um, Tesla and uh, and PayPal. So here's what he says in uh, this. Uh, uh, let me just read it here. So no near-term plans to IPO. Only possible in very long term when Mars Colonial Transporter is flying regularly. Okay. So <laughs> um, and uh, but uh, the, the important point here again I've highlighted. Don't read everything. Uh, um, and that is what he said here is yes. Also don't want pressure on the team to do a launch in time for quarter end and maybe miss something. Passing rate for a rocket is 100%. That's a nice way of putting it. So that's the context. And so here, you know, much, much more, now we're coming down to Earth again. You know, very, very simple, tiny little step. But the, the idea here is let's start out with a tiny step and then let's see if we can build on it and then do more. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, I think there, there may be potentially lots of th things that can be developed based on, on, uh, on, uh, on this starting point. So loyalty shares. What is the idea of loyalty shares? It's extremely simple. Um, we're going to give an, a, a reward uh, to buy and hold shareholders. We're going to equate long-term shareholders with buy and hold shareholders. It's not a perfect fit but it's a reasonable fit. If you're buy and hold, you're obviously going to pay attention to how the f stock will perform, what financial rewards you're going to get when you're, uh, uh, when you're planning to sell and not before, okay? And so uh, 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 buy and hold, it will be equated with long term here and we're going to, we're going to uh, separate out buy and hold shareholders from uh, other shareholders and buy and hold shareholders will receive if a company issues loyalty shares, uh, will receive uh, a, a reward. And this uh, loyalty period could be three, five, ten years. And then uh, the reward will be in the form of a warrant. So uh, if you've held these shares for this period, you get a warrant and then you have an exercise period. Again, it could be three, five, ten years. You could um, renew new warrants, you could, you could, you know, you could, once you start uh, thinking of rewards in this way, there's many ways you can construct it. This is just a, a simple starting point. So if you sell your shares before the th uh, loyalty period expires, you get no warrant. And uh, if you don't sell, you get the warrant. Okay, so here, the important point is behavior of shareholders determines ownership of the warrants. And uh, all shareholders are on equal footing when the, when the loyalty shares are uh, distributed. So there's no unequal treatment of shareholders here. Everybody gets the same thing. It's just behavior that drives uh, later differences. So um, in a minute, I will explain uh, how uh, these loyalty shares can be an effective uh, response by issuers in, IPO, in the IPO context to counteract a number of, uh, a number of uh, problems that we've seen 
uh, uh, that you know the, uh, the literature, uh, academic literature, has uh, highlighted that, uh, of course, practitioners are familiar with, and and uh, and one of the problems we've seen that with uh, with Twitter recently, uh, one of the problems with IPOs is uh, what happens around the uh, expiration of the lockup period, okay? And then there's a lot of uh, stuff that happens that uh, 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 some, may be counterproductive. So let me, let me illustrate so briefly uh, how, how loyalty shares can be used in, a, in an IPO context. And, and I'm, I'm giving you the broad idea. Uh, I will, later on, I will uh, give you a description of um, the key differences in rewarding long-term investment in the form of a warrant versus other solutions that have been uh, used. But I will keep it fairly general, and I'll, I will count uh, on your questions later on uh, to give you more detail. But here's, here's a simple way of thinking about it. You have an IPO, and, uh, and then uh, a few months later, the expiration of the lockup period, and we know that at that point there's a lot of pressure on the stock price, uh, unwelcome pressure. Uh, and uh, so, um, uh, how, how would uh, uh, loyalty shares uh, affect that? Well, uh, a loyalty shares would, uh, as, as uh, is mentioned here on the slide, they will smooth the selling pressure, right? Because if you have a loyalty period that extends uh, or even uh, stops at the uh, when the lockup uh, period expires, you still have the exercise period. You're still sitting over an American option the warrant, and you don't want to exercise that immediately, right? So, so there's going to be uh, a reason to stay on, stay, even after expiration of the loyalty period, there's a reason to stay on and, and hold on uh, to your shares. And then you, if you think that uh, it might be, make sense to extend the loyalty period beyond that, you can also do that. Uh, so um, the point is that instead of having this abrupt selling pressure, around uh, the uh, uh, expiration of the lockup period, uh, which creates unnecessary vol uh, volatility, you have a much more smooth selling pressure. That would be one advantage of loyalty shares. So he give, give you another advantage here, which is uh, uh, flipping. This is a common phenomenon with the IPOs. You have a lot of strategic buyers who come in. They buy on the first day, uh, and then they sell uh, very quickly, maybe at the end of the day, maybe a few days later. They just, they just look at for a quick uh, capital gain they can make uh, around the IPO. Now you can see that uh, if you had, uh, um, if you had uh, loyalty shares with a loyalty period starting uh, at the IPO date, uh, that's going to reduce flipping substantially because uh, you, if you flip, yeah, you cash in your short-term capital gain, but you lose the warrant, and the warrant could be uh, potentially pretty valuable. <coughs> And uh, that's a good thing to, to uh, think about also uh, uh, for, um, for your employees, right? Uh, one, of the, one of the, one of the um, things you want to do for a tech uh, IPO, for example, is you want to retain ta your, your talented employees. You've, you've awarded them a lot of stock options and so on. They become uh, equity holders. But you know, through loyalty shares, you can, you can ensure that they stay uh, stay uh, for longer. So that's one application. There are other uh, applications which are, uh, you, uh, you know, there are many, uh, well, several different. Uh, let me mention three that are important in our mind. One is rewarding cost monitoring. Now, if you do, if you engage, you know, this will be familiar to those of you who uh, are in the private equity world. You know, you don't turn around the company that quickly. Uh, your engagement with the company takes years. The results take years to show up. And so if you give uh, loyalty shares to those active investors, you, you, you allow them to, to benefit from, to, to get a reward for their costly actions. Uh, another uh, application which has been used in the past, not in the form of uh, uh, warrants, but in the form of dividends, is to, is to um, uh, use the loyalty shares to make up for a, either a dividend cut or a postponement of a dividend payment. And uh, again, those of you who've seen uh, when companies do this, 
typically there's a negative stock price reaction and you want to go over that. Uh, you, get, you want to get over that. You want to maybe dampen that uh, uh, negative stock price reaction. One way to do it is to combine it with, um, with uh, uh, loyalty shares. So I'm being told my time is nearly up. Very quickly, let me just, uh, 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 for those of you who are not familiar with this space, the, you know, it's not the first time people have thought about uh, 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 loyalty solutions. Uh, and, you know, there have been examples of you get extra shares, extra voting rights, extra dividends, and loyalty warrants. And what we want to emphasize in particular here, this has been a common concern. Maybe we'll come back later. People worry about CEO entrenchment when you uh, offer these things. And what I want to emphasize is there's no concern with entrenchment when you, when you use uh, warrants as your reward. Okay, so to conclude, uh, loyalty shares uh, uh, reward buy and hold investors. They align uh, uh, shareholders' interests with those of uh, uh, CEOs. Uh, and uh, one way to think about it is it's a stock option with vesting for shareholders rather than for CEOs, right? Because we are giving sh uh, CEOs a long-term perspective, giving them stock options that vest in three years, five years. We could do the same for, for uh, shareholders. And then we, we really have two, the two uh, uh, agents aligned in their interests. Um, so far, this hasn't been tried. Uh, every, we've, we've talked a lot with issuers. We've talked with uh, asset managers, uh, uh, et cetera. And you know, there's no, that doesn't seem to be a major obstacle. And uh, maybe that's, I'll conclude on that. All it takes an innovative company or VC firm take leadership and implement it. So maybe some of you will have that idea and uh, get started with it. So let me stop on, the, on this note.